He said he'd never seen anything like it. It was like ground glass um, looking nodules, he said. And um, so that's when the path went to Mayo Clinic in Arizona and they made that the final conclusion. But even then I still didn't have answers. It wasn't until about a week later when that pathology was returned to him from the Mayo Clinic that they, that they concluded that this was an unfortunate case of non-small cell lung cancer. Both lungs were involved. It wasn't anywhere else in my body, but both lungs had numerous, innumerable um, nodules in both lungs. So obviously, you know, no, no surgery would benefit. I wouldn't have any lungs left if they took out all those little bitty that I was inoperable out the gate. So he comes in the thoracic surgeon with this report and is like looking behind the door, you know, looking around this little tiny room and it's like, are you by yourself? And I knew right then what was about to come. I knew, um, I just had this dark cloud of empty <laughs> that just left, you know, it was, I can't even explain it, but, um, I was like, yep, I'm by myself. And um, at that point I was like, okay, I'm not gonna fall apart. I'm gonna bow up, I'm gonna do this. And I say often that, that was the, for lack of better words, the gut punch, the sucker punch of my life. And many I know also can relate and would say the same, but came out of left field for sure. Um, especially when you're thinking, oh, it's just benign. Nobody has lung cancer in my family. I don't smoke. This ain't lung cancer. But it was. It was as if it was almost like an out of body experience, a dream I was going to wake up from. I remember walking out of that doctor's office and the ladies at the front desk were like, hey, how are you? They had no clue what I had just heard. They were just doing their job and being nice. But I remember just not looking up at them, not just, I looked down and was like, fine, handed them my paper, gave them my debit card to pay my copay or whatever it is I had to pay. And I just like, kept my head down walking out that door. I can tell you exactly what those carpet tiles looked like even today. <laughs> and so I uh, was dressed for work. So I was, I had on dress pants and heels and um, I often say, and this is the best way I know how to put it. I felt like I had cinder blocks for shoes on my feet just putting one step in front of the other, just to get the heck out of there, just get me out of here. And when I heard the click of my car door, I lost it. I lost my mind. I was weeping and wailing. If somebody was nearby, they likely would have called um, a crisis intervention officer to come help me because I lost it. And I cranked up my car and just sat there. And then I had to call my husband and say, this is what's happening. At my initial um, appointment with the oncologist, you know, there was a mountain of paperwork, you know, you had to fill out. He was with me for two hours because I was just, this was a new world. And so he told me that he was going to send off um, the tissue and request, well, not send it off, but request for further testing um, from um, Mayo Clinic. And he went down the list with all the possible um, courses of treatment. If I had PDL1, this is immunotherapy and this is what it does and this is how you do it you know it doesn't um 
your hair will be fine, blah, blah, blah. And then if you have um, ALK, it'll be this. If you have this uh, EGFR, there's a brand new drug called Tegriso. It's a targeted therapy, you take it by mouth. Or if you don't have any, then you'll be on traditional chemo infusion. Well, I heard pill, take it by mouth. And I'm like, I want that. <laughs> It didn't work that way. You know, you don't get to choose it exactly like that. But he, you know, was rattling off all these letters and numbers. And I was just like, what? But the thing that resonated with me was pill and take it at home once a day. And I was like, I can do this. So I had, even though I had no idea about a mutation or a, biomarker or whatever thankfully he did and he was privy to all of that and knew okay we need to figure out does she have this or that and I did I was EGFR T790 and um, the oral treatment that I got to, to start um, targeted that exact mutation. And so I'm like, I have won the lung cancer lottery. If anybody can, you know, find something positive out of this, that I felt like I had overcome the world. I'm like, okay, I'm going to live. I'm going to be all right. More runway for me. Where's my pills? Give them to me, you know, because I had seen people sick on uh, infusion therapy. And I was like, I don't want to be, uh, and there are people that are so terribly sick right now that are fighting just to get up out of the bed and feed themselves to go to the restroom. So I don't take any of it for granted. And I certainly do not brag and say, look at me. I don't have to do all of that because I know things will change eventually. There will be a resistance. There will be a next treatment. And I'm not going to get to sit here and be here forever. But I certainly don't take for granted that I was able to, to take something by walking to my medicine cabinet and swallowing a pill that has kept those cells at bay and has kept my cancer under control. My tissue was already at Mayo Clinic from the thoracic surgeon that sent it over. And so um, I'm not sure who connected with who, but my oncologist was able to ask them to, you know, complete the biomarker testing. And that took, I waited a long time for that. It felt like it was like a couple of weeks and I was calling, do you have it? I actually went there for blood work um, shortly after, and he was like, I'm sorry, we don't have it. And so, you know, I'm like harassing him. And so finally he did get it back and he called me himself. He didn't send his nurse practitioner or a nurse or a secretary. He called me himself and was like, okay, here's what you need. Here's what we're doing. This is the plan. I'm going to send the prescription over to you know, where do you want it? So I picked um, CVS specialty, of course. He was like, you can do this, you can do that or whatever. Um, and so he was like, they can send it to you by mail if that's what you choose. And I'm like, yep, let's do that. And um, that was the end. And my question was, <laughs> can I have one? <laughs> can I have wine on this drug? And he's like, oh, so you want to get sloshed now? And I'm like, well, I have permission to do so, right? <laughs> so we kind of, you know, laughed about that, but he was like, go, he was like, live your life how you would normally live your life. You just have to take a pill every single day. So go do you and don't worry about restrictions. Do what you feel like doing. And so I was like, oh, yes, I'm going to be okay, you know. Um, but obviously with that comes side effects and a whole lot of things that I wasn't ready for. <laughs>
So I take my, um, I started it at uh, nine o'clock. The very first time, very first dose, I took it at nine o'clock PM because in my head I thought, okay, if I'm going to be sick from this, <laughs> this is how small minded I am. I was like, at least I will be in bed. You know, I will be able to hopefully sleep it off. And so that was my whole thinking um, around it. But it wasn't like, you know, taking an antibiotic, you feel funny, you know, within an hour, whatever. <laughs> the side effects stay and come and go. So I still take it at nine o'clock, but I still have, um, I still have some side effects, even 40, 43 months in on the same drug, um, I still have new side effects. It's just very weird, very, very strange, but you know, um, I'm thankful that I can still take it. At first I was, um, very, I don't want to use the word tired, but I just felt worn down. I felt heavy. Um, it wasn't that I wanted to sleep all the time, but I had very little like ambition, I guess. And, um, you know, if, if somebody said you can stay in bed all day, I would say, okay. So like that kind of leveled out and I'm like, okay, well, this is, this must be really working hard in my body. You know, <laughs> it's like a pregnant lady that's tired. You're growing a human. You're going to be tired. So I thought, okay, this medicine is, is working. And so my body's trying to get used to it and accept it. And so that kind of leveled out a little bit. And then there were skin rash. I had these little things that looked like little acne um, bumps all over. You couldn't treat it like acne. If you tried to do that, it like made it worse. Um, so I was able to take an antibiotic to combat that. It only lasted for about six, six months or so. And so I'm not, I don't have um, any skin rash anymore. That kind of leveled out also. Then um, I had new a new symptom of GI flares where there was um, sometimes nausea, but a lot of um, upset stomach. <laughs> and it wasn't necessarily, you know, I'd try to say, well, maybe I can't eat this kind of food or that kind of food. Maybe I don't need this. But, you know, there was no rhyme or reason to it. Um, Imodium became a staple in my purse, in my car, in my office, everywhere. I made a joke at work. If I'm running, don't stop me. I'm sorry. This is a fact of life. This is how it is. I still have the GI flares from time to time. Um, but currently, I'm absolutely exhausted. Like it takes all I can some days to move my body. And I don't know if that's a combination of medication, being the, in the middle of the crisis our world is in right now, staying at home. Um, maybe it's a little bit of an, of an emotional thing that's, you know, I'm just ugh, exhausted. Getting dressed is like a major ordeal, a major task for me. And so the biggest side effect with Tegriso to date would be fatigue, just overwhelming fatigue. And I try to move. I have an exercise bike. I try to get on it. I go outside. I try to walk. Um, you know, I was like, well, maybe I should go to the gym. I can get a trainer. He can, he or she can show me some light exercises that I can do to get myself stronger. I'm not trying to be a bodybuilder, <clears throat> but then we have a new uptick in our, and the things that are going on in the world. I won't even say the word. So now I'm like, well, maybe I don't need to go to the gym. Um, and then, you know, some days, if I want to just sit 
and st or stay in bed, turn on Netflix, turn on some music um, and sit in the recliner or lay down, I will. You know, I have to listen to my body. Um, I have found when I don't eat junk that I do feel better. And so I feel like diet does absolutely play a part. Um, I can feel when I'm dehydrated. I love coffee, so I could, I would much rather drink coffee all day than water all day. But I can feel the difference when I do drink water and when I don't. And so, you know, it's like, well, that's easy. But it's really not <laughs> because when I worked, I could I could have a bottle of water on my desk all day long or, a, you know, one of those big things. But when I'm at home, I don't I just, it's like I don't think about it. I don't know. But I can definitely tell a difference, especially when I go and get labs. I don't have a port, so they actually, you know, stick me. And it's a lot harder for them to get a vein when I'm dehydrated and it hurts. And so I'm like, okay, I got to drink water. I'm going to the doctor. But, um, you know, I have unfortunately noticed a huge difference when I don't drink enough water. And that sounds so crazy, but um, that often helps to boost energy. Um, I'm not a big supplement person. I know a lot of people rely on um, supplements. Um, I don't. Every once in a while I have, you know, vitamins and whatnot. Um, matcha and green tea, they say, is helpful. Um, but, you know, I might drink it today and then not for a month or two and then drink it again. So it's, I'm not consistent with, um, with it. There is um, a holistic clinic over near where my doctor is that does like a, um, a natural like infusion. And I so badly want to go and it's like 150 bucks to do it. Insurance doesn't cover it, but it's all good things. It's supposedly all natural and it would give you um, vitamins and minerals that your body needs um, to help. And it's specifically for cancer patients. And so I, I so badly want to go um, and, and, and do that. And so um, I think that would be something good. But then at the same time, I'm like, well, does that have side effects? <laughs> I don't think it does. I go every two months for blood work. And um, it's my blood work is fine every single time, which is another thing to be thankful for because so many have to come off of their chemo um, because of, you know, different blood counts, lower blood counts or whatnot. Um, but, and then I have scans every four months. I was doing every three, but we got pushed out to four months just to not risk getting any sort of like radiation poisoning. Um, and everything has been stable um, since I do CT scans. I don't do PET scans. Um, I just do head, neck, um, basically full body CT with, with and without contrast, head, neck, chest, um, abdomen, pelvis. So when they get me, they're like, we're scanning all of you. And I'm like, yep. And so, you know, now I've um, developed like relationships with the techs and with the nurses and they're like, oh, hey, you know, so I'm a frequent flyer. And um, sometimes they change out and I won't know who's there, but um, normally, you know, it's the same people. So they've like become my family and I'm kind of there, you know, so um, they're like, it's been four months already. And I'm like, yeah, it has. And so I'm like, wink at me if it's okay. <laughs> but luckily I get same day results. So many of my friends that I connected with in the lung cancer community have to wait days for their results. And I would lose my mind. Obviously, if that's my only option, that's my only option. Um, but, you know, if I go 
um, get a scan at 7.30 in the morning, by nine, I'm sitting in the doctor's office getting the results. So I'm super grateful for that because like I said, so many have to wait a week or more just to know. And we all have skin, skin anxiety. And so just going and then knowing that it's done, but you don't know what it said. It's like, how long can it take? But, you know, in bigger cities, there's so many people and they're just inundated with, with patients right now. Um, so I'm thankful that I'm in a smaller community and that that is an option um, for me, for sure. Early on, I, I made the mistake of going to Google, like I mentioned before. And then I started finding groups within social media that, you know, was like, I saw people that were living with this and I'm like, oh, there's hope. I, I can, I can keep going. I'm, you know, I'm not going to be taken out of here tomorrow. This is not a death sentence. It, I know what is possible. I know what the end result could be. And so I started looking at it as a chronic disease. And then, you know, people say, well, one day at a time, one day at a time. Yes, absolutely. One day at a time, because one day at a time is all we get anyway. And, um, I'm able now to think about things in a different perspective. I can get low, I can get sad, but I try not to camp out there. Um, initially, when I was first diagnosed, I said, this is what intentional living is supposed to look like. You know, I'd said all the things about cherish every day, life is a gift. Those are just pretty words. I didn't truly understand it. It didn't necessarily click. But when you're faced with your own mortality and it is concrete that this might end sooner than later, there's, there's a mind shift. There's a perspective shift. There's a new mindset that comes in. Do I have it all together? No. Am I always positive? No but I try to be positive and I try to um, always share the good things in that Tegrisso group. I am proud to tell people I've been here for 43 months to the person that just started last month or today or last week to just give hope because there were people in front of me through a screen that offered me hope when they were sharing their story. And so none of it is obviously to brag or anything like that, but just to say, I'm on this journey. I was 36 years old. It felt like the rug was ripped out from under me, but ultimately it's the, the club that nobody signed up for. It's the social club, the army, whatever you want to say that nobody signed up for. We were drafted, but there's an entire um, international group of incredible people within this community that simply want the same thing. And that's more runway. You know, it helps to have people that you uh, that understands you. My husband lives here in this house with me. We sleep in the same bed every night, but he has no clue what it feels like to have lung cancer. I can talk to him and tell him how I'm feeling until I am blue in the face and he still doesn't have a clue. But when you can connect to someone that also has just cancer in general, whether it be breast or um, any of it, we, we understand each other in a way that um, others can't understand us. And we understand a different outlook on life that others can't understand. I often say that I wish people could get just a glimpse of how we look at life now than before. I told my doctor, I was like, can I just take off the dirty socks now? Like, I get it. 
I understand I'm going to embrace life, you know, this way. I'm going to appreciate things that maybe I took for granted before, you know, the griping and complaining because somebody pulled out in front of you. Well, it's not really important. Move along. And he's like, you would revert right back. He said, if we were able to take this away, you would revert right back to your old ways. And I'm like, well, I don't want to do that. I want to, a lot of people say cancer was the best thing that happened to them. It took me a while to understand that, but I understand it now because I'm loved on by so many. Nobody necessarily feels sorry for me, but they show love. They check in on me. They, um, you know, send me a message. I'm praying for you today. Prayer's a big thing in my life. And so that just means a lot that somebody's thinking about me. Whereas before, maybe I wouldn't get those, you know, you might, but you might not. And so it's just been an incredible experience to be loved on by so many people. And also to be able to share like I'm doing today. You know, when I see or hear of somebody that's newly diagnosed with cancer, regardless of what kind, you know, I feel compelled to reach out to them to say, hey, you've got this. You're going to fight. It's going to get rough. You're going to experience this, this, and this, but you're going to be able to keep going. You're going to get up every morning. You're going to push through even when you feel like giving up because giving up isn't an option. You know, you were handed this for, um, whatever reason, we don't know the reason. At first, um, I thought I was being punished for something. You know, what's wrong in my life that I'm being punished? And that's not how it works. That's not how the universe serves us. That's not how whatever higher power that you look up to, that's not how it works. This is merely something that has happened to us and not who we are. And I feel like that is, um, I only was able to grasp that through time because it, it felt like I did something wrong to deserve this diagnosis when in fact it just was like a car wreck. A car wreck often just happens. And so, um, We didn't know what tomorrow held before lung cancer, and we certainly don't know what tomorrow holds with it. So I try to keep that perspective as well.